All right. Welcome everybody to our Thursday seminar. Appreciate everyone who's who's joining us online for this this virtual seminar and a few of us that are here in the seminar room watching everything. So I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items before I introduce our seminar speaker. And so remind everybody that you know please uh, keep yourself muted uh, during the talk and turn your videos off. And then when the talk is over, you'll have an opportunity to uh, ask the speaker questions live. You can also type questions in to the chat and I can ask those to the speaker as well. And when we call on you, use the raise hand feature in Zoom to raise your hand if you wanna ask a question. And then we will call on you, ask you to unmute yourself. At that point, you can turn your video on and, and have a conversation with the speaker. All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce our, our speaker today. So Dr. Danielle Halsey. Uh, is, is going to be talking to us about using tags and tech to support conservation and management in a dynamic ocean. So uh, Danielle did her Bachelor's of Science at Gettysburg College, and then she completed her PhD in 2017 from the University of Delaware, where she was characterizing the movement ecology and the social dynamics of a coastal top predator on the East Coast, which is the sand tiger shark. And so, you know, that's the one that has, if you see pictures of them, they have like millions of tiny, really long, super shark so they look crazy scary, but in reality, I think they're pretty docile. They're like kind of a nice shark, unless you stick your hand in their mouth, I think. <laughs> and then after uh, Danielle finished her PhD, she, stuck, she stayed around for about another year in Delaware, where she was examining species distribution models and habitat selection of fish in areas propo proposed for offshore wind development. After that, then she came to California and she was a postdoc and then a research scientist at the Hopkins Marine Station. Mainly she was working with Larry Crowder and, and other people there. And a key feature of her research is integrating advanced biologging, basically using tags on animals, and remote sensing and underwater robots to study the impact of a dynamic ocean on the occurrence and distribution of marine fish and sharks. And using these technologies, Danielle focuses her research on tackling applied research questions, uh, contributing to bycatch reduction strategies, impact assessments of offshore wind, like we talked about, and working towards more effective dynamic ocean management strategies. Basically trying to figure out, you know, how do you deal with managing fish in particular that live in this you know, offshore in the Pelagic Ocean, but conditions are always changing, right? How do you, how do you really deal with that? And her work spans uh, multiple oceans. So she's worked on the East Coast, as you mentioned, studying uh, sharks and sturgeons in the Atlantic, fisheries ecology of billfish in the Eastern Tropical Pacific, oceanography at the White Shark Cafe in the Central Pacific. And she's also done work uh, down off the Nansen Ice Shelf in Antarctica. So she's been everywhere, lots of cool <laughs> places. And then uh, when Roxanne you know, was, was soliciting speakers this year, I went to the Hopkins website and I was like, I'm gonna go look and see if there's any postdocs or other research scientists that I don't know that are doing cool things. And I clicked on Danielle's bio and I was like, oh, she is doing some really, really cool research. And so I asked her to come speak. At that point, she was leaving Monterey. And so uh, she's currently down in San Diego. She's the chief science officer at Hub SeaWorld Research Institute. And she's, again, continuing to specialize in fisheries oceanography and spatial and behavioral ecology of marine animals. And she leads the strategic research plan for the Institute's programs focused on sustainable seafood, ocean health, animal behavior, and wildlife. So with that, Danielle, take it away. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for being here. And I'm sorry that I, we just, you just missed me from being in person and I was hoping to make it up there, but hopefully um, meeting you all virtually will suffice. So um, really excited to be here and share with you guys some of the, the things that I think are really exciting um, related to tags and tech and how we can use some of these technologies to support uh, management in a dynamic ocean. So I'm actually going to start by asking you to think about how we manage and conserve natural resources on land. Um, and if we take, for example, the mass migration of wildebeest and zebra across the Serengeti, you know, throughout the year, we have over 2 million animals migrating across this huge swath of land following seasonally available food and water resources. And the importance of this natural wonder hasn't been lost on researchers and people have spent years studying this ecosystem in really great detail. And often in terrestrial systems where we have something this magnificent and something this um, you know, large and important for the ecosystem that we wanna manage or protect, our solution is to draw a box around it. We draw a box around the range of the species or for example, here you can see the simplified migratory route of these animals across the Serengeti National Park. 
and several of the conservation areas and uh, game reserves that have been developed to protect this really uh, amazing natural wonder. So with these parks and boundaries in place, we can then limit access to these animals and use things like visual surveys to keep track of how the populations are doing, um, to, to manage things like enforcement of different rules and regulations, and to also manage and keep track of shifts in the species distributions. But it's harder for the average person um, to see this, but we actually have really arguably even more impressive migrations occurring all the time in the ocean. So for example, within the coastal ocean along the US East Coast, we have millions of bony fish and elasmobranchs, you know, different shark skates and rays like you see here. These are the beautiful sand tiger sharks that I studied on the East Coast. Um, they're migrating along the coast following seasonally available ideal habitats and food resources. But we're often much more limited in our knowledge of the geographic extent of these marine species and their population statuses because it's simply really hard to see underwater. And additionally, it, many of these marine species range entire coastlines or even crossing whole oceans. And this really makes management protection efforts extremely complicated. And if we follow our terrestrial model of just drawing a box around it to protect these marine animals, we're finding more and more that we're falling short. So on this map, um, I'm showing uh, the white line that you see delineates the mid-Atlantic shark area, which is a time area closure that is designed to protect seasonally migrating sharks off of North Carolina. The points that you see, the black and white points, represent daily sand tiger locations, with the black points being the shark locations that occurred while the time area closure was in effect. There is not many black points on this map. So what you're seeing is that this closure is mismatched in space and time to effectively protect sand tigers and likely other species that are moving through this area as well. So why is there this breakdown? Well, when we're comparing marine systems to terrestrial systems, there's some fundamental differences that really cause the conservation and management strategies that we've developed for terrestrial systems to fall short in the marine realm. And the main difference is relatively simple. The marine environment is highly dynamic. Everything from the nutrient availability to the primary pro producers, everything on up to the tops of the food chain, everything is in constant flux and moving around because of the nature of life and water. However, on land, these, we, these ecosystems are, are relatively static with primary producers grounded um, and habitats remaining stable for larger and longer spatial and temporal scales. So just to put it plainly, the ocean is different than land and it needs to be managed accordingly. And one strategy that's increasing in momentum is called dynamic ocean management, which is defined as an adaptive approach that uses near real-time data to inform the spatial and temporal distributions of management or conservation actions. And the classic case study for this concept comes from the California current ecosystem. Um, a lot of this work has been done by the, the great scientists over at the NOAA uh, Southwest Fisheries Science Center, just a, a across the bay from you guys. Um, but within this ecosystem, for those of you who don't know, the, there's a drift gill net fishery that historically is targeted thresher, thresher sharks and swordfish. However, non-selective gear like drift gill nets have huge issues with bycatch or unintentionally uh, caught species. And in fact, this fishery has had tremendous issues with catching hundreds to thousands of protected marine mammals, seabirds, and sea turtles throughout the history of the fishery. And the numbers shown on this slide are just for 15 years um, of the number of bycatch incidents that were reported. And one species in particular concern is the Eastern Pacific leatherback turtle, whose population has decreased by 90% uh, since the 1980s. Issues with bycatch has led to the creation of multiple time area closures along the California coast. This figure shows the spatial and temporal extents of those closures with the bars on the left hand side showing the overlapping temporal extents of different closure areas and the shaded areas on the map showing where the um, those closed areas occur. And you can see that there are time area closures basically everywhere now. And the um, Pacific Leatherback Conservation Area covers an enormous area off of the Oregon and California coasts from late August to early November. 
And while these closures are meant to protect vulnerable species that were getting caught as bycatch, they've also impacted the fisheries economy. And since the mid 80s, the number of vessel permits for swordfish has decreased from 300 to um, 18. And the situation is even more, has changed uh, very recently as well, which we'll come back to at the end of the presentation. But I think it's really important to note that swordfish is still being consumed in the US and 84% of it is, is imported, which means it's coming from somewhere. And I want you to really think about and consider what sorts of environmental protections that other fisheries around the world may or may not have to safeguard against catches or issues like bycatch. So we have this relatively healthy population of swordfish off the coast of California. It's listed as a, not an overfished population, but we aren't accessing it um, very effectively due to conflicts with these time area closures and issues with uh, bycatch in gear. But uh, researchers were uh, a few years ago now were asking, what if there was another way to both reduce bycatch and allow access to the target species. And this was a hypothetical idea that was put forth by Sarah Maxwell in 2015, where instead of a box closure, the closed area shifts and moves dynamically in response to how the habitat and therefore species distributions were shifting dynamically. And in 2018, Elliot Hazen at the no um, and others at the NOAA Southwest Fishery Science Center brought this reality by integrating dynamic models of swordfish distributions with dynamic models of the distributions of the commonly caught bycatch species. And I can't get into all the details of this final product, but the culmination of this work is EcoCast, which is a described as a fishery sustainability tool that helps fishers and managers evaluate how to allocate fishing effort to maintain target fish catch while minimizing bycatch of protected or threatened species. And the model integrates satellite data into species distribution models that produce daily risk maps showing areas that are poorer or better to fish based on the fisher's likelihood of interacting with the uh, bycatch species, the species that we're trying to protect. So, and it was estimated that if managers were to use this dynamic model to create closure areas, these closure areas would be 50 to 75% smaller um, and still protect critical bycatch species, which would then open up uh, productive fishing areas back to the fishery. So that's just one example of a really great model of how dynamic ocean management could work on a relatively well-studied ecosystem. And this figure provides a framework for dynamic management as synthesized for both oceanic and terrestrial ecosystems. And many of the systems that I've worked on are not as well studied as the California current ecosystem. So much of my research to date has focused on simply trying to get the biological and environmental observations that are needed to build these tools to inform dynamic management efforts. And I'm also really aware that people are a part of the system and increasingly I'm working to include stakeholders like fishers um, and other users into the planning, data collecting and capacity building aspect of my work. So the first study that I'd like to introduce relates to the sand tiger shark, which we talked a little bit about already, um, which is a fairly large coastal predator found along the US, the east coast of the US. These sharks spend most of their time near shore and relatively shallow, but often turbid uh, water, and they rarely come to the surface. And because of this, much of the information that we have on sand tiger um, spatial and behavioral ecology in the US, at least, comes from something called acoustic telemetry. Now, traditionally, acoustic telemetry is a technique that allows researchers to track and record the locations of aquatic animals. And it consists of two parts, an acoustic receiver and acoustic tag. Um, acoustic tags are, are either attached or internally implanted into an animal that you're trying to study, and they send out coded acoustic signals that are unique to each individual. They're like a barcode made out of sound. And when an animal like a sand tiger swims within the detection range of an acoustic receiver, that unique identification code for that animal is recorded on the receiver along with the time, uh, at a time and date. So this information is then archived on the receiver, which has to be recovered to retrieve the data. And because receivers have to be recovered, they're often deployed in areas that are close to shore, which uh, or in air locations that are more easily accessible to researchers who have to go and maintain this equipment out in the ocean. 
So this means that even an acoustic array that is considered relatively expensive, like this one that I'm showing that I was working within um, in the Delaware Bay on the East Coast, these arrays are often arrays of receivers um, are often inherently gappy. We can't put a receiver everywhere, and so and we often really can't deploy them far far off of our coasts, and so that really limits um, kind of the the information that we can get because of our limitations of where we can deploy this gear. So to combat this, um, when I was working on my PhD at the University of Delaware, we actually worked to integrate acoustic receivers into an underwater robot. And we named this the first um, underwater robot that had this uh, these integrated acoustic receivers, OTIS, or the Oceanographic Telemetry Identification Sensor. So if I refer to the glider ever as OTIS, that's what I'm talking about. Um, but in addition to recording detections of these acoustically tagged animals that we were interested in studying, Otis simultaneously was measuring the temperature, salinity, oxygen levels, chlorophyll A levels, and other measurements of water clarity every few seconds. And this gives us a really high resolution look of the underwater environment where acoustic animals are found or not found. So um, a glider is a buoyancy driven underwater vehicle, which means instead of relying on a motor to power the vehicle forwards, it uses a pump to pump water in and out of the vehicle, which changes its buoyancy and allows the glider to glide forward in a sawtooth pattern using its wings. And every time the glider surfaces, we're able to connect with it over satellites and relay either new mission information to it or retrieve snippets of data that the glider has collected. And um, the unique thing about having this glider with integrated acoustic receivers meant that we could also um, know in near real time when we were detecting acoustically tagged animals. And then because the glider was able to send us that detection information, and then we could adapt to the mission accordingly with that new information. So this is a map of actually the first glider mission that we ever ran with Otis with the gliders track in yellow, the location of where we detected some of the sharks that I had tagged with those acoustic tags, um, that's shown in the blue dots, and then the traditional acoustic receivers that were deployed in black. You can see that the traditional acoustic receivers were arranged in such a way that they acted like gates, so they're perpendicular to the coast. And this was to detect migrating fish, um, and in my case, sand tigers, as they headed south during their fall migration along the East Coast. The glider was directed to fly in between two of those gates, the Fenwick Gate and the Sheikatig Gate, to not only measure the environmental conditions where the animals were detected, but also to measure the locations of uh, sharks in between these gate arrays to kind of show, you know, serve as a proof of concept that we could use this underwater robot to kind of fill in the gaps. So here's what glider data looks like, just so you can get a feel for it. These are ribbon plots are actually the compressed seesaws. So all of those seesaws going back and forth, if you just squish them together, they start to look like vertical profiles. Um, here I'm showing temperature uh, going from top to bottom, temperature, salinity, speedom or color dissolved organic matter, chlorophyll, oxygen, and then the glider's distance to land at the bottom there. So if we focus on just the beginning of the mission, you can see that one of the benefits of using an underwater robot is that you get to see when the ocean is stratified or um, where the measurements of the surface ocean conditions are different than the, the bottom of the ocean, which is actually where a lot of fish and especially my sand tigers are often occurring. They're often found not at the surface, but um, near the bottom. Um, and in this case, actually, we had a fall storm come through and the water column mixed and remained relatively well mixed for the, for the rest of the mission. So you can see that um, kind of change happening now that I show you the rest of the data. The dash lines represent the approximate time and location where sand tigers were detected by the acoustic receivers on the glider. So to quantify small scale habitat selectivity, uh, I say small scale because this is about a two and a half week window of just their fall migration. Um, but to quantify their habitat selectivity during that time, I compared the distributions of these environmental variables where sharks were detected to where they were not detected. And if the dis distributions of that variable were significantly different, then that variable was considered selected for. 
What do I mean by that? So to visualize what this looks like, we can look at these uh, four distribution plots. The distributions of available habitat are shown in red, while the um, conditions where sand tigers were detected are shown in blue. So in the simplest sense, we're looking to see how these distribution shapes differ. So for this relatively small scale study, uh, we found that sand tigers were selecting for waters slightly lower in salinity, higher in color dissolved organic matter or CDOM, which you can see um, it's basically just dissolved organic stuff in the water. It turns the water slightly more yellow. Um, and then also waters that were closer to shore, but they weren't, interestingly, they weren't selecting for, at least at this scale, things like water uh, depth, water temperature, or oxygen. So the properties that were selected for are, we actually think are related to the Delaware Bay River plume. So it's this water mass that exits the Delaware Bay and hugs the coast to the south of the bay and could be you know, coincidental or it could be this navigational aid for sand tigers so they kind of know what direction to go as they're leaving and heading south uh, for the winter. So this glider mission that we ran was really, an, on the small scale, was really informative as to what kinds of environmental variables might be predictive of sand tiger occurrence in the region. And so we scaled this up um, and scaled up our understanding of habitat selectivity with sand tigers in kind of the whole mid-Atlantic region by building a species distribution model of their occurrence using satellite remote sensing data and then those acoustic telemetry observations from the moored receivers uh, from those stationary receivers. The weekly predictions of this model are, um, are, are what you see in this animation here. And these models have actually been useful for making management decisions. And based on the information that we collected, the Delaware Bay and the surrounding coastal ocean were designated as essential fish habitat and habitat areas of particular concern. But these designations are again, static designations or boxes that we've drawn in the ocean, even though my product is dynamic in, in nature. Um, and this is something that we'll come back to. Similar model outputs for another um, imperiled species in the region, the Atlantic sturgeon, have actually been implemented in a dynamic management tool for the Delaware Bay. Uh, essentially, this is a very similar modeling process using acoustic telemetry and satellite data to build a distribution model, but we distilled that information down to create risk categories for different regions in the Delaware Bay that were relevant to where local fishermen and managers um, where they were areas of interest for them. And it, through this modeling and this tool, we were able to highlight areas of high or low risk of sturgeon encounters every day. So this information is mailed available on a website um, and it's also communicated to fishermen who are participating in the product, in the, in the program through an automatic text alert system. The models, um, if we jump back to sand tigers though, I wanna talk about another interesting aspect, which is that the models were slightly different for each of the different life stages of sand tiger sharks. So I'm talking about, you know, whether or not they were juveniles or mature uh, sand tigers. And there were even differences between mature males and mature females. But for simplicity here, I'm now showing the model outputs, the predicted presence or absence of juveniles in green, adults in red and juvenile and adults in purple where they overlap. So as this animation plays, you can see that there appears to be some separation in the population, which is really important for managers to consider when evaluating the impacts of, um, of different, you know, different things, different things that might be impacting those species um, because the, those impacts may disproportionately proportionally affect different portions of the sand tiger population, depending on when and where those impacts are occurring. So, so far I've focused on sand tigers in the mid-Atlantic, but sand tigers are known to seasonally migrate along most of the U.S. East Coast. And this was summarized in a paper focused on just the juvenile sand tiger migration uh, along the East Coast by Jeff Nebone in 2015. But in addition uh, to segregating by size, like I just showed you in my model outputs, previous research using pop-off satellite archival tags on sand tigers have provided some evidence of sexual segregation in sand tigers, at least during their fall migration. And, and um, in the mid-Atlantic, I also saw segregation, a little bit of 
segregation in my model outputs. So there's that complexity. But in addition to this, we're all, we also know that um, sand tigers like to aggregate in these huge schools. So not only in the Delaware Bay, where I was focusing my research, but also in waters with much better visibility than the Delaware Bay. This is a photo from an underwater photographer from off of a, um, a wreck in North Carolina, where sand tigers are also known um, to, to aggregate in huge schools there as well. So we have these two areas where we know they're aggregating, but what about the rest of their migration? We know they're found from New England all the way down to Florida. During the whole time, are they always together? Do they ever disperse? Um, do they segregate like where some of our um, tagging efforts appear? Um, and also, try, it's I'm really curious to think about why, why might they be forming groups at all? It's not typically what we think of these large kind of apex predators doing. So I want to take a step back and actually just think about why do we even care about group behavior? Um, when we're considering any animal, there are external and internal drivers that influence individual movement decisions, which then in turn affect group size and, comp and composition. And if we think about some examples of this, I'm going to transport us for a second back to the terrestrial world. Um, and consider an animal that it might be easier for us to imagine them making these decisions. For an animal that we consider, you know, relatively intelligent, like an elephant, we can really easily imagine different scenarios where elephants make choices about where to be and who to hang out with based on what's going on around them and where they are in their life history. For example, elephants may form groups to defend against predation or to exchange knowledge. Um, mothers may segregate into groups of only other mothers and calves to protect their young from aggressive males or to share in the responsibilities of, uh, you know, raising their young. When habitat conditions are good and resources are plentiful um, and abundant, elephants may form large groups comprised of females, juveniles, maybe even the mature males are allowed to come hang out. But when food and mating resources are limited, elephants may go off on their own and form smaller groups to reduce competition for limited resources. So we can kind of imagine all of those scenarios uh, happening for an elephant, but what about in the ocean? So how do we even begin to measure these types of behaviors for animals underwater? Uh, well, it's tricky, but we're trying. And to do this, we're using an, another type of tag, uh, another type of acoustic tag called a VEMPO mobile transceiver or a VMT. So VMTs are transmitters and receivers in one. So in addition to communicating with moored receivers, they are also receivers themselves, meaning that anything carrying a tag that swims near a shark or an animal carrying a VMT is recorded by that VMT. So it's important to note that like traditional receivers, these tags are also archival, meaning that if you're going to put one inside of an it on top of or inside of an animal, you need to be able to get it back to get the data. So working with the vets from the Georgia Aquarium, I developed a method to internally anchor these tags to the inside of the body cavity of sand tigers so that once they were inserted, we could suture the incision close, release the shark and allow it to undertake its natural migration, potentially as far away from the Delaware Bay as Florida. And counting on the fact that uh, we had previously seen about a 70% return rate to the Delaware Bay from one year to the next. Um, so at that time, we deployed 20 VMTs and mature sand tigers. 12 of them were females, eight of them were males. We spent a lot of time the next couple of years actively tracking down any of those 20 sharks. We call them our golden sharks, carrying VMTs that returned uh, to the Delaware Bay. So we set a lot of long lines uh, to try and recapture these sharks. And apparently you can put a dead fish on a hook in front of a sand tiger, but you can't always make it bite. Um, we did, however, successfully recapture two of the tagged sand tigers. Both of them were males around the same size, which we called ST1 and ST2. You can see the healed incision scar in that bottom left-hand photo from the original tag implantation. And that helped us locate where the internally anchored VMTs were. We were able to successfully recover two of them and download them. 
we had no idea how much data was going to be on those tags, but we were um, really excited when we found that each of those tags had tens of thousands of detections from multiple different tag species. So from this data, we were able to show that the aggregations of sand tigers change over time. And these network plots show the changes in the size and the composition of aggregations of sand tigers throughout their annual migration with males in blue and females in red. And just to break down how these plots work, I'll go through an example plot from September. So colored plots on the left-hand side represent sand tigers, other tagged sand tigers that were only detected by ST1 during that month. Colored points on the right-hand side represent sand tigers that were only detected by ST2 during that month. And then colored points in the middle were sand tigers that were detected by both ST1 and ST2 during, um, at some point during that month. And then if there's a black line connecting the two um, ST1 and ST2, that means that they detected each other. So I'm gonna summarize my findings in a little bit of a cartoony way, but I've included the representative network graphs in the upper left-hand corner so that you can kind of see what I'm talking about. But really from um, all of those graphs, we identified four distinct phases of sand tiger group composition from the tag data. And the first was a summering or a pre-migration phase. This occurred when sand tigers were still in the Delaware uh, Bay area. The sand tigers were mixed in terms of size and sex, and they were, there was really high detection overlap, meaning um, that many of the sharks that were detected by one shark were also detected by the other shark. This really we're considering kind of a community hotspot, um, which may be due to the abundance of food or really ideal habitat conditions for them during the summer. Now, as the sharks leave the bay and begin migrating south during the fall, the network analysis shows that the groups change, the group sizes change, um, and the composition change to be uh, more described by smaller adult and subadult males. And it's possible that during this time, we're observing kind of the similar results of the sexual segregation that I described um, that previous tag tagging, satellite tagging studies had found uh, earlier. During the winter months, when the sand tigers were estimated to be off of the coast of North Carolina, we observed a mixed population again with very high community overlap. You can see that those network diagrams are basically overlapping with each other, meaning they were all kind of hanging out in the same area. Um, in this region, the habitat constriction may be aggregating sharks off of you know, as the coastal shelf narrows along the coast and the warm waters of the Gulf Stream run close to shore, it really may be constricting sand tigers to, to occur in this smaller um, area. In addition, the physical structure of the plethora of shipwrecks that are in this region, um, they're already known to attract sand tigers, and it's really a popular attraction for recreational scuba divers in this region. This is a underwater video from a scuba diver on a wreck off of North Carolina. And in this video, I think you can really see just how closely these sand tigers are to each other at certain times of the year and how densely aggregated they can be. I'll let this play for just a second so you can see. So finally, in the late winter and the early spring, before the sand tigers return north, we believe that they spend some time in the South Atlantic bite during what I'm calling uh, the dispersal phase. So the network graph for this month is very distinct, with ST1 only detecting seven other individuals and ST2 detecting none for multiple weeks at a time. And it's possible that during this time, we're observing another instance of sexual segregation. Remember, these are both males, so the females could just be out somewhere else, avoiding hanging out with the males. Um, the sand tigers may also be dispersing to reduce interspecific competition for limit potentially more limited food resources in this region, or they may just be dispersing as the habitat for them has really expanded in with the um, coastal shelf really, it's much wider in this region. So they might just kind of be spreading out. So that was just a quick recap of that project, but what I want you to take away from it is that it really reinforces the idea that not only are populations dynamically located, but so are the individuals within that population. 
And when we're thinking about dynamic ocean management and protecting a species that occurs along an entire coast, it's really important to think about how subtle differences in the occurrence of different life history stages may mean that, a pop that population disturbances may be disproportionately affecting certain subpopulations. For example, you know, like this pregnant female um, that you can see here. And just as an aside, these tags are also useful for more than just studying within species group behavior, but also inter-specific or within or among species associations. So this network graph shows all of the tagged species that were detected on the VMTs carried by the R2 sand tigers. And it's possible that future studies could really use this technology to study ecosystem level interactions. For example, you notice that there's uh, a lot of green points on the left-hand side, those are Atlantic sturgeon. And this was a fish that uh, a few years ago was listed as endangered. So it's possible that future management protections that are put in place for Atlantic sturgeon may also have beneficial impacts on sand tigers who are closely associating in similar habitats. So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the work um, that I've been work focusing on more recently related to tagging of billfish in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. I'm using this slide as a transition slide because I wanna showcase that it's not only bright, sunny um, and tropical days out on the water when you're working with uh, in this ecosystem as some people might think it is. Um, but the goal of our project down in the Eastern Tropical Pacific is to try to assess how changes in the oceanography and ocean climate may affect the occurrence of two economically and ecologically important fish that occur uh, in that region, uh, which is the blue marlin and sailfish. The vibrant ecosystem, ocean ecosystem in that region supports multiple stakeholder groups, including commercial and recreational fisheries, as well as substantial conservation and ecotourism industries. But many of the aspects of the ecosystem in this region are really understudied or poorly understood. So um, if we can understand the impacts that changes in the oceanography of the region have on these species at different scales and, and from diverse perspectives, then we can really start to disentangle what are the environmental impacts and then what are the potential anthropogenic impacts such as overfishing or, uh, or bycatch or unintentional catch by fishers? And how are those two things just um, affecting the distribution and occurrence of these species in the region? So to do this, we're using pop-off satellite archival tags or PSATs, which are tags that are carried by an animal for a set duration until it is released from the animal it floats to the surface and transmits packets of collected data to satellites. The animal's movement track is then reconstructed using a light-based geolocation algorithm, which uses day length, sea surface temperature, and local bathymetry to approximate the track for the animal. In addition to deploying our own tags between 2019 and 2021, we also partnered with multiple institutions to pull together historic efforts, uh, tagging efforts, focused on these two species in the region going as far back as 20, uh, 2005. All of the tag data that I'm going to present to you came from different but comparable models of PSATs made by wildlife computers. And really, including this historical data allowed us to increase the temporal coverage of movement and distribution data collected from fish. And that meant that we were getting information from fish experiencing different seasonal, but also climatic conditions. For example, here I've now colored the years by the ENSO phase. In addition, collaborating with different research teams really expanded the geographic coverage of where tags were deployed in the region, which allowed for a more comprehensive view of fish movement in this region. So here are those tracks now mapped. Tracks from both species are, um, you'll be able to, to tell as they continue to play really highly concentrated in the more coastal region of the ETP with the exception of one blue marlin that will come along and you'll see that that blue marlin traveled over 6,500 kilometers to the west over the course of about three months. But really when we're comparing some of the movement metrics between these species during this uh, across the study period in this study area, 
Their track distances are pretty similar, maybe slightly longer for blue marlin, but their daily displacements or how far they're moving in any uh, given day are pretty similar for both species at about 30 kilometers per day. Um, but that really showcases how highly mobile they are. And there went that, that offshore fish. I just caught it out of the corner of my eye. So in order to, to um, take that and kind of summarize it down and visually compare shifts in the centers of activity, we wanted to look at this by season and then also by climatic condition. Um, but we looked at the median and ranges of those geolocation estimates by month. You can see that in general, the center of activity is further to the south and near shore during the dry season. And it um, extends to the north and further offshore during the rainy season. And you can see that's particularly apparent in the blue marlin data on the top panel. Um, but it, if we instead plot something similar, but aggregate the locations by their ENSO phase instead of by month and season, we see a shift slightly north and offshore for both species, but again, especially blue marlin during the cool ENSO phase with the center of activity again shifting south and into the Panama Bight during warm phases. And one of the reasons why we're really um, interested in looking at how their distributions are shifting in response to the ENSO of the El Nino Southern Oscillation is because El Nino's really provide a snapshot of how environmental conditions might exist more consistently in the future. And they can kind of be considered a, a climate stress test that may indicate how different species will respond to climate change. So these results have implications for the effective management of these species. So to look at this, here I have these tracks colored by the country's exclusive economic, exclusive economic zone or EEZ where the fish was. And if we, we then went and calculated the percentages of time that these fish spent in each EEZ. So here I'm showing these pie charts. And um, one of the major takeaways from this work was we were able to show that blue marlin and sailfish spend actually very little time in international waters, seven to 8% of the time uh, blue marlin and sailfish from, from our track data show that they were in areas beyond national jurisdiction. The other thing that we're really seeing, and you can see by the, the number of slices of each of those pies is that these fish are highly mobile within the national waters found in this region. Um, and so one of the major takeaways from this work is really that placing the blame on any kind of population declines on you know, unregulated fisheries that are happening out in international waters really isn't supported by our tag data. And as space use within EEZ boundaries potentially changes in a changing climate, we can start to think about potential winners and losers in the long-term success of recreational and domestic commercial fisheries. The existing management in the region is largely ad hoc. And so equitable solutions for the future really require these countries to coordinate management efforts and consider proactive rather than reactive efforts if distributions of these fish are expected to shift in a changing climate. So I just threw a couple, you know, um, different, but I hope you can find the synergies between those projects kind of together. Um, through those projects at you. But to wrap up, um, you know, I've shown you examples of how technology can contribute to dynamic ocean management efforts. And I've showed you a few examples now of tools that have been developed really to implement this information to help better manage and conserve our oceans. But we're not quite there yet. So instead of implementing EcoCast and potentially reopening some of the fishing grounds, the end result is that we're buying out the remaining drift gillnet fishing permits. And I'm not saying that that isn't the way to go. Gillnets are notoriously, you know, they have issues with bycatch and a conservative approach has been decided to be the best solution here. Additionally, these restrictions on fisheries led to the acceleration of efforts uh, to study the feasibility and switch fishing practices over to other fishing techniques, for example, deep set buoy gear. Um, which is much more selective and has fewer issues with bycatch. But I think it brings up an interesting point of discussion about what is the future of actually implementing dynamic ocean management.
So I'd like to argue that we're getting to the point where we have the technology to collect the data. I showed you a few different examples of some really interesting things that we can um, leverage different biologging and underwater robot assets to better understand what's actually happening beneath the surface of the ocean. We're getting good at creating models and, and testing and validating those model, models and then creating tools um, that are hopefully becoming more and more useful for not only fishers, but also managers to try to help support dynamic ocean management. But change is really hard and our bureaucratic process really isn't set up for this type of management right now. And so what I wanna leave you with is that I think we, we still need more people with expertise in data science and computing, uh, social sciences and political sciences to be thinking about these problems and working towards management policy and enforcement solutions that can benefit both people and the environment. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Um, like many tagging studies, you know, my acknowledgement slides are always full of names and logos of people of organizations that have made this collaborative pro these collaborative projects possible. A huge thank you to all of those and the fishers who helped in the field. Um, but with that, um, I will take any questions you have. Awesome. Thanks so much. That was a really interesting, really exciting talk. Really Thank appreciate you. it. So let's see, do, do we have any questions of people in the room or online? If so, raise your hands. And while we give people a chance to do that, I'll ask a question. Great. So I was curious kind of uh, what's how receptive have, I guess, fishermen been to these I guess using some of these new tools, are they, is it something that they would really like to have at their disposal? Because maybe it's going to open up a lot more fishing grounds to them, or are they a little nervous about the technology? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm going to answer it with, you know, a question you might expect. It depends. Um, a lot of fishermen are really open to these types of things, especially if they are facing, you know, the types of just static, you know, closure that kind of mindset if they're in a fishery where there's a lot of closures being implemented on them that they don't necessarily feel are fair or um, kind of like the, the right solution. So those types of people who are in that situation, oftentimes they're, they're pretty open to these ideas, but there can be issues with the technology. You know, how do you actually communicate on a daily basis with fishermen, how are they expected to know? Some fishers have a ton of technology at their disposal and integrating kind of these ever changing boundaries might, you know, if we can just serve them to their plotters that they already have on their, on these huge boats, it might not be that big of a deal, but especially when we move um, outside of the U.S. or to smaller scale fisheries, that, that kind of technology, you can't just assume that they're used, they have that kind of technology at their disposal to be able to even you know, receive updates at this kind of time scale that we're talking about. And so that was one of the reasons why um, on the East Coast, we moved to try testing out this texting warning um, based system where we basically had like three different just regions. Those regions were always the same, but what the risk categories in those regions would change on a daily basis. And then we could just text that information to fishermen because most people, at least at this point, have access to cell phones. Um, so it, it's complicated. Some fishermen are, are all on board. They see the value in it because they see that it can help us, you know, better manage all of the different competing uses for ocean resources. But then at the same time, there is that access issue to technology that can be a barrier for some to be able to actually implement and, and abide by these kinds of ever-changing regulations. And then what do you think about the I guess the cost or the cost effectiveness of doing this dynamic management, right? Where you're needing these streams of data, I guess, coming in fairly regularly. Is it, mm -hmm. do you think we're to the point where many of those streams are, are cost effective to maintain, sort of keep this up or is, or is that another potential barrier? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, there can be a lot of upfront cost, especially when you're moving into a species or a system um, that is pretty understudied where you don't have a lot of those data points already in terms of where species are found. 
And I would say it's probably important to constantly be trying to refine models as they're being developed. You know, you can't just like create one model in 2010 and then just assume that that's going to be, you know, correct in perpetuity. But um, once you get those models built, I think we are collecting a lot of a lot of data already. We have a lot of long term management. I'm always going to say we need more data. There's always more data to be had. But that's a great question in terms of the economics. Um, I would say when you're facing potentially shutting down whole fisheries, whole seasons, you know, those fishing economies are bringing in millions, millions of dollars and our support are very important for a lot of people's livelihoods. And the economics of it is, I'm not really sure. It would be a really interesting question. But for me, I think the you know, the livelihoods of, of people who depend on these ocean resources and the people that, you know, eat, need the food and the working waterfronts and all of that industry that it, it supports, I would say probably would justify the cost of maintaining those data streams and, right. and, and that, yeah. managing the resources better and, and more sustainably. Yeah, I think how much money we spend to keep salmon going right year after year. So <laughs> yeah. probably costs more to do that than you actually get from the fisheries. So yeah, yeah, yeah. good points. All right. Who else has questions? Anyone else in the room? We got a question here in the room. Jess right. is going to come up and ask you a question. Hello. Um, that was Hi. a really cool talk. Um, I was super impressed with the amount of data you were able to gather from just two of those tags that you put into 20 sharks and I just wondered if you could speak a little bit more on like how that worked getting those back and like I don't know is there any way to get the the tags back from the remainder of the sharks or if that's like not even an option anymore so yeah yeah great question and thanks for asking it so I get to talk about that more because it was such a fun project and that's why I still talk about it many years later um yeah so we actually so the battery life on those VMTs was only it was about a year um and so we had to we wanted to be able to track those individuals for longer than a year to potentially have more opportunities than just one summer season to recapture them so we actually double tagged them with another smaller tag which lasted for four years that was pinging at a different frequency so that we would be able to track them that way without them without it having a tag inside of itself that it was just constantly detecting so that meant that the first summer after you know our first summer after they had been tagged we had that whole summer where they were um that we could track them on two different frequencies if that makes sense um and so we would act we would go out on the boat every day there's a few spots in the delaware bay where we kind of know where they like to hang out and it's pretty interesting too there are different groups like cohorts of sharks within the population that we know like to hang out in different little spots in the delaware bay and so we would kind of know where they were who, you know, what friends they like to hang out with. And we say, oh, we just saw that shark. So let's keep looking. And we would listen and listen. And so we were actively tracking down these individuals that we knew had those tags. And then just setting long lines in front of them as often as we could, trying to like match the currents, you know, thinking about the them smelling the bait on the line. It was a lot of just trying to like put ourselves in the mindset of what these sharks were doing on, under the water to try to recapture them. Um, and I will say, we, you know, we were actively tracking more than just those two uh, sharks. We probably actively tracked over 10 of them throughout the next couple of years. We just couldn't get them. They just like are, came to the boat that one time and they were like, no, we're not going to fall for that again. I don't know. That's probably you reading into you, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's reading into it too much. Um, I will say that we did, that, so there are, there is a NOAA group in the region that does an annual shark survey in the Delaware Bay, and we did share our tag codes. So in addition to the internal acoustic tags that we could track, they also had an external, you know, regular spaghetti tag, one of, the, um, just a little plastic tag with an identification code on it. And so we shared that list around with um, the 
the NOAA group that did the annual shark survey in that region. And, and we said, you know, if you ever recapture one of these sharks, please, you know, keep it like next to the boat and call us and we'll come out on the boat right away and go, you know, try to recover the tag from it. And that didn't happen until like six years after the project had ended. And I was already in California by this point. And we got an email, you know, that said, oh, yesterday we recovered one of these sharks and, you know, it was fine. And then we let it go. Um, and so there was one more shark that was captured, but not in a way where we were set up to, to have them. You know, we're, we're not sacrificing the, the fish to get these tags back. We were, or the sharks, we were um, getting the tags and then sewing them back up and letting them go. And so they weren't set up to do that type of thing. Um, so there was one more that got away that we were able to recapture. And so if there ever is a shark that washes up on the beach, you know, something happens to it, or if anybody ever finds one opportunistically dead, maybe we'll be able to get a tag back in the future. But for now, um, all of the tags that th they had are dead. And so it's just going to have to be something fate decides for us whether or not we get the rest of those tags back. So we have one question online, but I was asked very quickly in relation to this. So the the two that you recovered, mm -hmm. right, they interacted with other sand tigers. Were those the other 18 that were tagged with those VMTs or were they just other sand tigers that were tagged in some way by you or other, or other groups? Yeah, I'm sorry that I didn't make that more clear. So they, at that time of the study, we had over, we had like 350 sand tigers that were tagged with not VMTs, but just the regular, just the regular acoustic, acoustic tags. tags. Okay. Um, and so that's what makes up most of, some of those could have been other VMT sharks, but most of those were just other sand tigers that had been tagged. We had a pretty extensive tagging program going between 2008 and 2013. Um, and that's, so we had like 350 juveniles at to all the way up to adults tagged with um, acoustic tags that they were detecting. And then the plot that I showed with all of the different species, those are similar. So those were all of the different species that were tagged with um, those same acoustic tags that other researchers had uh, tagged those species for, you know, their own projects. And through a collaborative data sharing network, we were able to identify, you know, what tag code went with what species and get permission to, to, to use that data. And, and we shared it back with them. We said, hey, our shark, you know, detected your, your species. Yeah, super cool. Super cool. Okay, so was it Kinsey was right? So we have uh, Kinsey Matthews is, is wants to ask a question and she's online. So Kinsey, you can unmute yourself. She just finished her thesis doing uh, species distribution modeling. So I, I have a guess of where this question is headed. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah, um, thanks. Yeah, that was an awesome talk. So yeah, as Scott said, I recently defended and finished my thesis and I focused on species distribution models at a much smaller scale. And I found that when I extrapolated my models to a different location, I got pretty low accuracy results for most of my models. And it looks mm -hmm. like for your um, sand tiger, models, it was extrapolated outside of the Delaware Bay where your um, acoustic receivers slash Otis, where they were mm -hmm. distributed. So I was kind of wondering if you were able to test your extrapolated model on other areas to obtain um, an, accu an accuracy result and kind of how that worked for you. Yeah, that is a great point. Um, we did not. Um, and so we did build in some constraints. Um, depth was a major constraint, you know, we knew that they didn't go beyond a certain depth. So we tried, we didn't extrapolate beyond that. Um, we, there weren't other, there might've been a, so short answer is we did not, it would be great to do that. And I'm sure there are slight differences. I will say that one thing you may have noticed that my model didn't project into the Delaware Bay. And that's because I actually built separate models for the Delaware Bay and for the coastal ocean, which I didn't show just for simplicity, but um, it, I talk about it more in the paper because there were different relationships with like the sharks had different relationships with those environmental variables, depending on if they were in the Delaware Bay or if they were outside of the Delaware Bay. Um, 
And so, you know, and basically like they're found in the deepest waters of the Delaware Bay, but then when they're in the coastal ocean, they're actually found in the shallowest waters. And so there is kind of some of that going on that we had to account for. I will say that there's another paper that I um, published where we kind of tested what you're talking about and, and showed that there, so there's a similar species, of dis, uh, species distribution model built for Atlantic sturgeon, which I talked about in that region, but we sent the glider down to the South Atlantic bite. So basically off of like um, South Carolina, Georgia area down there and using detections from the glider of sturgeon down there, I matched that up with the species distribution um, model projections of what the, that model, if we just took it as it was built for the mid-Atlantic and transported it down to the South Atlantic, and just like you would expect, it like completely doesn't work. Um, because one of the things is, is like a lot of these species distribution models use things like time um, to account for seasonality that like just isn't captured in environmental variables. And so then when you take that just as it is built in one region and transport it into another region, it usually completely breaks down. Um, one thing that we did find that's pretty interesting is there's so there's like integrating all these complex relationships with the environment into these complex species distribution models. But then there's also an approach where people are just using seascapes where it's like we're categorizing basically water masses in the ocean and finding the relationship that these species have with water masses. And what we found in that paper with the sturgeon was that while the species distribution model didn't transport the relationship that sturgeon had with the seascape um, did transport. So that like simplifying it a little bit was transportable. Um, that was way more of a answer than you asked for, but yeah, so it's a great point that models like this and especially as they get more and more complex and more refined and specific to different environmental variables, they lose kind of that ability to capture the broader picture of what's going on. You have to be really careful about your extrapolations. I think Kinsey appreciated all those details. <laughs> no, no, that's, really, that's really great. Do we have any other questions online or anything or anyone else in the room? Uh, let's see what's happening. That's just, yeah, everyone's saying great job. Greg Kaye said, nice talk. Everyone else, great job. Yeah, cool. Well, I think that's it for questions. You survived? <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. Yeah, thanks. That was a really interesting talk. Super exciting work you're doing. And yeah, if you're back in Monterey, you're always welcome I'll let to come you know. visit. Yeah, yeah, definitely have to. Hopefully soon. Very great. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.